All right, welcome back to another episode of Conversations with Jay. I got another special guest in the building. I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. Hey, everybody. I am Serenity, best known as Nitty on social media. Uh, and I am a realtor and digital marketing strategist. Okay. Where are you from exactly? Like, where you grow up at? The city. So, I was born out west um, at Bethany Hospital. Okay. Which is no longer a thing. Um, and then when I was about 10, uh, we moved to the South side to Chatham oh, okay. and we kind of moved around a lot. Um, then we moved over to Midway, the Midway neighborhood when I was going into college. Um, so I'm literally from the entire city. All I've right, lived so you, on the South, East, North, West. So you literally have all perspectives of the city. Yeah. It's I like was, living in High Park, but you know. Yeah. So what was it like growing up in each of those areas? Like, what was something that you took away from each of those areas? Um, so at West, I was little, you know. So um, we lived in, like, apartments. You know, it was the, the coming up without the most type of vibe, um, running into the house and come around the couch as mice, you know. So, and when I was young, it was just the... Um, the development of me, my mom, and two of my sisters at the time. It's five of us, five kids total. Okay. Um, but living out west, you know, it was just being young. Didn't really know much. Went to Robert Emmett Elementary. Went to Brown, which is by the United Center. Um, so those were just like the, the young years of the happiness. And then when I went south, um, going into my teenage years, like sixth grade, seventh grade, um, it seemed normal. My parents kept us occupied so it wasn't necessarily a thing of where I lived I never really identified with the neighborhoods because right. my parents uh did their best to keep us involved and when I was in high school I was at Whitney Young so I was in majorettes and um cheerleading and dance and all these different things so for me um the only neighborhood I would say that looked different was when I moved by Midway Airport because it was Polish and Spanish. Right. Um, and it was it's still a great environment. Our block was very friendly. Um, really good friends that are Polish and really good friends that are of the Hispanic background and stuff. So, you know, that's when I started understanding cultural differences. And then when I was in college, went to Columbia College downtown, and then I moved to the north side. And, you know, the north side is like white-faced all around by the time I'm getting to this, you know, the adult age. So it's just really been um, a development of understanding different cultures. It never really was like smacking me in the face because we were always protected. Yeah. What was, what was you say is one thing you want to be when you were younger? <laughs> or the dream you had? So my dream was to be just like Raven Simone. That's so Raven. Okay. Because she could sing. She could dance, she could act, she was pretty, she was funny. Um, and that kind of started my journey into wanting to be, like, on TV, you know. So Could, could you sing, though? A little bit. Okay. I could sing a little bit. If I, Of course, you know, with training and stuff, it could probably be better, but I could definitely hold a note. I just sang on a few songs. <laughs> now, you went to Columbia College. Like, what, what was your major at Columbia College? I changed it three times. Okay. So I started in broadcast journalism. Then I went to fashion design because my mom is a designer. And then I went to um, marketing. And then I didn't graduate from Columbia because um, our house caught on fire. So it was hard. They took away all my credits from the whole semester and it discouraged me. So I was just like, why would they do that? Um, they was already taking so much money. So, you know, I went back to a media school, Illinois Media School, to did do broad your, broadcast journalism. Did they take your credits because you, you couldn't afford to pay or something? <clears throat> so, um, the way it happened, I was doing pretty good the whole first semester, the fall semester. And then in November of 2011, um, our house was a part of a three-building fire. Okay. Um, and basically... Um, I was out of school for that next two weeks because my family was going through it, the, the whole homeless thing, like needing a place to go, trying to figure out what's next. It's a seven-person family, you know, right. so my mom and dad trying to balance it, plus me being in college, 
trying to go to school. I was staying with my friends at the dorms. Um, they were feeding me. Um, but Columbia, because I had missed those two weeks and didn't take the final, they withdrew the whole semester That's worth of crazy. credits. And then they told me, they wouldn't pay me back for them. And they say, well, it's not necessarily you failing, but you could take these over. But I'm like, but you didn't pay me back. And I don't have, you know, this is an expensive school. So the next um, semester, I went to Hare Washington College just to try to get my associate's degree or something. Um, but I was also trying to balance taking care of myself. I had to get an apartment. Well, I didn't have to. I chose to, right. to not be a stress on my parents and the other uh, four kids. So I got an apartment, a full-time job that I worked on weekends. So I was working like 10, 12 hours on um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and going to school, and letting two of my sisters stay with me because they needed to go to school at Kenwood. So it was really just like a very traumatic time that um, really just changed my perspective of what it means to be a hustler and how to grow into being able to be self-sufficient. That definitely sounds like a, a lot for a young adult to have to go through. And we all, a lot of people say they got it out the bud, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people be lying. But for <laughs> you to go through these things and, and come out okay, like yeah. that says a lot about who you are as a person. It was definitely tough. Um, and I think sometimes I'm getting better with like not crying about it because I was 19. You know, um, trying to get the degree, trying to do it the traditional way. Um, and a lot of people don't know that my family lost everything. You know, my family was, uh, outside of me getting an apartment, my family struggled being homeless for about a year. We were on the news, everything. And it was kind of embarrassing at the time because it's like, man, like we just look so ridiculous. And I never wanted to be in those videos. I never wanted to be in those news articles. So I was like, I got to help my family change the dynamic. And I'm not ever going back home after this point, you know. And people know me for being happy and like this unicorn and like um, super positive and also very vulnerable, but they don't know where that vulnerability started, started. And it started the moment that we lost everything, you know, except each other. And the way that fire happened, my whole family would have been dead, you know, like except my little sister and my little brother and my mom and dad, three, three daughters would have died. You know, three of us would have died, but it was like, it was like a divine intervention type thing with yeah. the way that the night happened and how God played a role in us being closer um, and realizing that our lives are more important than the material. Um, so, you know, I definitely got it out the mud. And, you know, I'm sure people do feel like in their situation that they're getting it out the mud. I wouldn't say that they're lying. It's just struggle. It's different for everybody. Yeah. But people don't know that part of me. They think a lot of people think I was handed a lot of the stuff. Um that comes with me or my brand, but it's like, no, I, I built it literally just me from the, the marketing to, to everything, to the radio show. Like that was like all me and just like being good at it and just like taking advantage of the fact that people believed in my dreams. Now what came first? Was it the radio station or the marketing? So it's kind of crazy. It kind of happened at the same time. Cause when I was um, 19, I built the first website for, my ex-boyfriend's big sister. And she was like, oh, well, I want to do this. And I was like, well, I kind of know how to make websites. And she trusted me to make her first website. I made her best friend's website. Um, and I've always been interested in the progression of the internet. Right. So um, the visual part of making things look good and feel good was kind of my start. But the radio started when I was at Illinois Media School and J.R. Bang. Um, from Windy City Underground, he Andy. let me do his entertainment segment because I came to Illinois Media School pretty much on top of the whole internet part of it. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, I got a website. Oh, yeah, I do this thing called Nitty's Knocker. I do this, this, that. And then he was like, you have a lot of energy and you seem like you know what you're doing. Do you want to do my entertainment segment? So I got my first big deal, in a sense, from J.R. Bang. Um, it was like, knock, knock, it's me, you know, so I had like my entertainment segment and then I started my own radio show at, uh, Windy City called the Nitty and Slinny Show with, uh, my co-host. Uh, and then I got an opportunity from Q4 Radio to take over, uh, a previous show where they were relocating. So I took over Splash Paradise Radio for Earn, 
earn money and it was like a um kind of like the hipster type of show and I stayed with Q4 for about four years and I developed the Nitty's Knocker radio brand now being in in media and, and marketing like a lot of people don't understand the the daily struggle that comes with being a creative so how hard was it for you to juggle both of these careers in one well I wouldn't say it was hard to juggle it because I kind of like just did it for myself, you know. So all of the punches, all of the the errors, the difficulty, the people saying no, like, oh, your show not good enough. I don't want to be on your show. And like I went through all of that on my own. And then that's how I developed the actual unicorn piece of my radio brand. So uh, unicorn gospel was a part of my show. And the unicorn came from the darkness, you know, like I was always feeling like the underdog. I always feeling like I'm in the background, like people didn't care about what I had to say. I always wanted to fit in. And then I was just like, I can't keep doing that to myself because I was going into deep depression. And the unicorn thing was like, I'm going to be bright. I'm going to be radiant. I'm going to glow. So me creating that as a creative in radio made it very easy for me personally to just figure out how to be better at being the unicorn. So I would start going to all of the festivals. I would drive 20 hours to South by Southwest. And at the festival, I was wearing a horn. Like I literally would walk around with the unicorn horn, pink wigs, white, silver, shiny festival type stuff. You and I the assignment. Yeah, so, and that gave me the attention of people like um, Genius, who was K Camp's partner. Um, I met Childish Major. Like these are people that I could text and be like, hey, what's up, I'm in town. But it's because I stood out enough to where if they looked up South by Southwest 2020 or 2018, my picture would pop up because I was using those hashtags too. So if they looking for, dang, I saw this girl walking around with a horn on, I need to see where she at. They were looking up hashtags for the festival to find me and kick it with me. You know, so it really was like, it was only as tough as I made it because the thing with being a creative is you have to be okay with the fact that it's, it's not going to always go your way, but you have to do it your way. You know, you have to have your own niche, even if we all doing the same thing, what's going to make you different. And if people stare at you, that means you're doing something right. Was it something that, that you learned going through everything that you went through to say, man, I'm going to drive these 20 hours. I'm going to put this work in. Because a lot of people don't understand that, that part of sacrifice. They don't. And I would say the thing that drove me was the exhaustion of um, not being noticed. Um, or like when I was doing radio, I would interview everybody. Like I know a lot of people who do media stuff, who write books, who do all this stuff. And I would interview all these people, but nobody ever did it for me. You know, so... That's a part of why I quit it, too, because it was like, yeah, there were certain people who saw me and saw the vision, but it was so many more who just either didn't want me to win or didn't want me to surpass or whatever. And it made me feel like, OK, I got to do whatever it takes for me to get noticed because I'm tired of people not noticing all of the hard work that I put in. So it was very personal. And I used to take it really hard, um, feeling like nobody liked me and. You know, and I'm like, I'm so nice and I try to be there for everybody, but like they never call me. They never want to kick it in over this. And it's just like, well, maybe that they're just not for you. You got to be for yourself. Yeah. Now, you, you briefly spoke on dealing with depression, like depression and, and mental health is a big thing nowadays. But I had a conversation with with I can't remember who I was talking to. But I'm like, when we were kids, we didn't know that we would dealing with depression and mental health we didn't know what was going on so mm -hmm. how were you able to to one deal with that and come out on the other side <clears throat> my family um my mom was really good with reassuring us that we were great and my father um my stepfather was really good at paying for whatever we wanted to do even if it was his last um, and I was the oldest. So if I had dreams, they were pushing me to do it because I was persistent. Like, I want to do this. I want to do this. And when it came to, and then my real dad was just like a, you got this, you got this, you know, that person who going to brag about you to the end of the world. So dealing with depression, um, and certain aspects of it, like you don't want to talk to nobody about it because you feel like people don't understand. Um, but my family pays attention to the way that we feel. 
Um, and now we've been able to bring it down to like, she's 10 years younger than my, my little sister. Um, and I can see it sometimes like, Hey, are you okay? You know, without even seeing it. So having a strong family that, um, held you accountable to, it's like, yeah, you feel a way we're going to talk about it, but we also going to figure out how to change it was a very, very important thing to me. And that's why I started my radio brand with the unicorn gospel. Um, and even within real estate and everything I do, it's like I want to help people feel better, you know, because everybody don't have what I have. I'm very grateful to have the big support system that I have. I want to show other people what that feels like in whatever way that I can help them. Now, we were talking briefly off camera. You said you stopped doing the radio show because of COVID. Like, mm -hmm. explain that to me. So it's crazy because in like... I would say maybe November or October of the year before COVID of 2019, I had this really, really big event. It was like 200 plus people who came out because I was supposed to be going FM with a black owned radio station. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. I get to help build a new black station in Chicago. Right. Um, and so many people came out in support. I had people on my team. I had like three DJs. And a co-host. Um, so when it didn't happen, because there were things that messed up, there were like companies trying to buy out this company. It was making it hard for them to be able to purchase the string. Um, my team fell apart because, some, you know, everybody felt like at this point we need to do our own thing. And it's, for me, it, it hurt a little bit, you know, because I was like, man, like, I developed this whole thing, and y'all helped me, and now that it's not going the way y'all wanted to go, I don't have no DJs no more. I only had my co-host at that point. Right. So it hurt to, like, have a team and then people, like, leaving you and not really saying why they leave you um, and, like, kind of ending their belief in it. So... You know, me and my co-host were going to keep going or figure out how to do it. And we were like, you know, girl, we got this. Like, you know, we love them and, you know, we hope that everything goes well for them. But we got to keep this going. Her name was Mo Better. And me and her are still close to this day. Um, but then when COVID happened, I couldn't go back to Q4 Radio because I had already left. I was like, well, I'm about to be FM. Right. Um, so I, I need to move on and get bigger. So I couldn't go back to them. Then COVID happened. I lost my job. Like, I was, like, living alone. So I didn't live with my family, you know. So it was a lot of depression coming back in. And there was 2020 was probably, like, the toughest year of my life. And I was not motivated to do um, anything until my sister, my other sister, stepped in and, and paid for my real estate classes. And she was like, I think that you would do really well in this. Um, but, you know, COVID... It, it drove me to not want to do radio at all anymore based on the series of events that led up to that. Now you you're in real estate and mm -hmm. obviously you thriving in real estate. So would you say that once again, that happened for the right reasons? Um, yes, I would say, uh, again, with my family and my siblings, we know each other like the back of our hand and she was taking the classes in the beginning of 2020 and she was just like, yeah, no, I think this is a serenity thing. And, you know, I had lost my job. I couldn't get another one because everybody was closing everything. And I had, you know, I was living on my own. So she was like, I'm going to pay for your real estate classes. Um, and I think you're going to kill it. So I spent from March to May studying. Um, and I passed and, you know, taking the classes, I passed the pre-license and then I went and took the license in class, passed it on the first try. My sister once again paid for my license. And um, I was, you know, I was on the verge of losing my truck. I was on the verge of, you know, I couldn't hardly pay my bills. I had got ghosted in a relationship during COVID. So I was like really struggling and I didn't want to like make my family feel like I was struggling. So I didn't even tell them much. And, um, it did change the course of my life because I had to persevere through a pandemic alone. I couldn't see my family even if I wanted to at that time. And my guy was just not caring. You know, he didn't have to work. He was getting paid and still wasn't coming to see me. He didn't want to help me financially. Um, so I lost like 30 pounds 
but I still passed my test. You know, I was like, I'm stressed, but I'm going to pass this test. I'm going to get my license. And by December of that year, I was from being in like the negatives financially to grossing about 15 K within three months within real estate, you know? So, um, it definitely changed the course of my life. And it also showed me how strong I am, um, in the face of adversity. You literally became a real, a real estate agent low key at the perfect time. Cause the housing market is doing something that I've, I've never personally seen that it do. Right. Like people paying $50,000 over the asking price for housing, even more than that. So, like, do you ever look back and be like, damn, I went through all that just to make it to this point? Um, it's still, like, surreal. Because never in my life, I've been a hustler since I was 19, you know, like, trying to figure out how to make my thing pop, the thing that I love pop. And it's, like, still, like, am I really making deals where, like, I'm – getting cl like cl people are randomly calling me like it ain't as consistent as I would want but of course I'm still new but it's like in my first year I went nuts you know for somebody who did it full time like no other income but real estate and it does feel very crazy that I'm a part of something that will never it's like a recession proof job once you really get the hang of it do you own any property yourself not yet are you looking to buy yep I work with a lot of investors, so I um, project manage their rehabs, and I pick the property, help them pick the properties, and I sell it to them, and then I project manage the construction, and then I list it for rentals after, so I know how it looks to take something from nothing into something great, you know, so for me... Um, and then, too, you know, it's not a traditional, I don't have traditional income yet because I don't have tax returns to show how much money I make for my own business. So I can't buy property the way that somebody with a W-2 job can. Right. So it's a little tougher. I have to save different. I have to um, allocate funds different. Um, and I have, me and my family have very big plans. And I talk about my family a lot because we are each other, you know, like we do everything together. So um, we have big plans on a family level and on personal levels with how we want to take the money that God is giving us in different capacities. All of us are getting blessed in so many different ways now that it's like, OK, we get these bands. Now we need to do something with the bands that's going to produce more bands. So yeah, I think that's where a lot of people go broke at where they start getting this money and they have no idea what to do with it. They get, they hold, they get scared to invest it. But the thing is, if you didn't have it before and you got it now, like more, you know how to live off nothing, right? Yeah, facts. If you have to live off nothing because you took five to 7,000 to put with another person's five to seven and another person's five to seven, you can live off some, off of nothing for six months because you know that your return going to be better at that point because you've invested the money that was handed to you. You know, we get so scared when we get big sums of money, like, I ain't going to get this again. You got it once, you can get it again. You can, and it's, it's really about reinvesting it. You know, that's how these white people <laughs> making their coin. You know, like, they literally don't shop and spend all their money on stuff, and when they do spend it on stuff, it's because they've already reinvested it so many times into their businesses, into hiring the people to run their businesses, and they broke for a little while, but they keep going, you know, so. They gonna get it back. Yeah, always. How did you get into the, the, the project management side of it? Um, so my first big client is from Los Angeles. Okay. And um, they don't know Chicago. So I was pretty much getting the property for them, and then I helped them find a contractor. Um, finally, we have the best contractor. We had some. Some hard I know times. You gotta go through a couple. Whew, <laughs> Lord, but because I, that first project, I was you know walking the person through it and giving them updates all the time and giving them recommendations on stuff we should try, and then they were just like, you know, maybe we would like to pay you as our project manager. They're like, we want to pay you because you have really been helping us as our feet on the ground. 
So now every project that they get, I get paid three different ways with them. Fact. From fi from uh, being their buyer's agent to their project manager to their listing or selling agent at the end, you know. So um, I enjoy it. So now it's something that I'm going to, like, maximize off of with other clients that I get. Okay, let's say I'm trying to purchase my, my first home. My credit is not the best. Coach me through this. So the first thing you want to do, do is have the mindset to say, I really want to change my situation because you can get credit repair and spend $90 a month or something for it to be restored and to learn how to pay down the things that you have to pay down and get the other things removed. So you have to have the mindset first. And in three months, your credit will be exactly where it needs to be, you know. And you also have to have the mindset to save, too, you know, because even though you could get, like, down payment assistance and all of this cool stuff, you still might have to come and drop some some coin. So it, at the least, you want to have at least five to seven thousand dollars in your account for like a low price property of, of like one hundred thousand dollars or one hundred twenty thousand dollars. You want to have that in your account, even if you don't have to spend it. Right. If we get closing credits or grants or whatever, you still want to have that mindset like I've saved up for this. My credit is in order because I paid to, to take care of that. And now I can be an owner of something. And then when you own something, you have to decide what type of owner do you want to be? Do you want to be an owner who has no responsibility? Cool. Be a condo or townhome owner. But if you want to have responsibilities, buy a traditional home, still don't want responsibilities, hire a property manager. You know, so it's really just like taking the time to navigate your life the way you feel it needs to be navigated. You know, you can't go into something and make excuses with real estate. You have to be ready. Now, let's say I want to, I want to start investing. Uh, I, I personally tell people don't start with the home first, start with a two, three flat, mm -hmm. use the two, three flat to get to home. Mm -hmm. Like, would you, would you push somebody towards that way? I would if they were, so there are two ways to invest. You can do it the multi-unit way where you're just collecting rents from other people um, and then move out after the year, refinance, whatever. But then it's the fix and flip way too. You know, like if you, let's say we come, a lot of people come into money, right? You can buy a property, flip it, take that money to use it to get another property. Right. So then at that point, you've done a flip. You have money to get another flip and you can go ahead and get a multi-unit or something, you know? So it's like, you can really, the, the two to three unit way is a good way to just start if you um, are not necessarily trying to be an investor, but you want to have generational wealth on a, a easy level. You buy your first multi-unit after a year or two, you buy your next one. And then at that point, you got enough equity to where you don't have to wait a year or two with FHA or something. You can just use a conventional loan. And, you know, use the money you make it from that to put down payments on the next one. Yeah. Go to another state, buy another multi-unit in a different state, you know. That way you maximize your portfolio um, to where you can finesse it with FHA. As long as you, it's another state, you could do FHA as soon as you're done with the first FHA. I bought my first property, and I hate to say this. I really hate to say this. But I bought my first property cash. Mm -hmm. like, even though I don't have to pay a mortgage or anything, and I have a, a renter in my unit paying rent. I still wish I still had that money, you know, and I took out a loan. And I used somebody else's money to, you know, fund this property or mm -hmm. my first property because I still have more of a cash flow to, you know, like you say, go out and do something else. So, I mean, with a situation like that, you it's a fear thing or, or uh, facing a fear type of thing. Because if you have a property with somebody in it, sell the property and take that money to use to get a loan on your next one. You know what I'm saying? It's a seller's market. Make it nice enough to where you can sell it, FHA, conventional, put it at a non-greedy price point because you own it. Yeah. Everything is, is butter, you know? So just sell it and then start your process over from that point because owning stuff, would, and then you selling it at a market rate. So it's not necessarily bad that you bought it cash, but if you want to make... How much did you buy it for? 53. Okay, so where is it? It's in Pullman. 
Oh, it was in Pullman, so it's probably easily worth like a hundred, hundred fifty thousand. My cousin, he also a real estate agent, so he told me we could probably get two for it. You know, depending on what it is and what it looks like. The thing is, just because you have it in the neighborhood that look good, or or a neighborhood that's on the come up, it still got to look like something. Yeah, it still has to be efficient enough to sell it for two hundred thousand. Don't think just because the rest of the stuff selling for that price that yours can too. I'm cool for the the one to one fifty as long as I at least double my you know yeah. initial investment. I'm cool with it. Yeah, it's de- it's definitely and then too like real estate like it's a lot of realtors out here, um like cookie cutter realtors right where everybody kind of look and move the same. It's okay to get uh, evaluations from different realtors and work with different realtors for different reasons, you know. Sometimes some people may not be um, educated in a field within real estate because it's so vast that they, it may not be their strong point, but you have somebody who know it, know how to make it work, and then you just kind of balance how you work with your realtors too, you know, like, and sometimes you got to just find your person, you know, um, and that's kind of like my approach with, with what I do is like, I don't care if you're my client or not. I'm not going to withhold imp- like information that could help you win. I'm definitely going to give it to you straight. I'm going to give it to you like like your homie. And I'm going to tell you, no, that's stupid. You shouldn't do that. Or I'm going to tell you, actually, that make a lot of sense. Like, this is the best way you can do it. Talk to this person because I know that they could help you get to where you got to go. You you spoke on, on bringing people into the investment. <clears throat> Why do you think people shy away from real estate especially like it was a scamdemic in chicago <laughs> you got people getting 200 a hundred thousand dollars you know and still just deciding to just splurge that money when i could bring three of my homies in we could all put up 15 a piece and we could go find us a property that's because a lot of people probably tried it with traditional lenders if you have unconventional money it's not coming in the right way. You have to go to hedge fund people or private investors. And it could get discouraging if you like, oh, I got all this bread. I'm going to go talk to Wintrust Mortgage. Or I'm going to go talk to this company or this company. And they're like, um, no, we need W-2s. We need tax returns. We need blah, blah, blah. We need credit, right? There are people out here that I work with specifically because I believe in black wealth. I don't care how you got your bread. I know somebody who's going to fund your project. Because it's a money maker. Investor, these hedge fund people and people with all these millions of dollars, they look for things to funnel their money through. So if it's real estate and it's a good, it makes sense for them to have a 30-year loan with you or one year. You can do different options even. You do a one year when you want to flip it. You do a 30-year when you just want to create more income on top of your loan. Right. You know, and, and that's the reason. I, and I feel like people just think it's so hard. And it's tedious. It's not hard, though. You know, it's really just reading a book. You know, I wrote an e-book called The Home Buying Process. And it literally just takes you from step one, which is knowing your whole team, to the closing table. You know, because it's just little details. And you're like, oh, okay, so this is what I'm supposed to do right here. Okay, this is what I'm supposed to do in this, in this situation. Oh, we're at this step of the process. And then it's like helping you understand. It's like the real estate for dummies book, you know, but I don't want to call it that because right. <laughs> that's offensive to me. Don't call me no dummy, <laughs> you know, but I think it's really just like when you have money that was not uh, legally obtained or even if it was, but you don't have a way to prove it and stuff, it gets tough when you go going into a field like real estate, which is a federal thing uh, when it comes to loans. But there are people who have money like angel investors, hedge funds, those people do it a lot with real estate and commercial projects. Like if you look at Sonder, I don't know if you ever heard of Sonder, but it's like a better version of Airbnb okay. where they buy commercial buildings or build them from the ground up and it's properties in it with studios up to two or three bedrooms, but it has like your refrigerator stove, you could cook. It's like living in an apartment, but you have a concierge in the building. That concierge treats it like a hotel. So that's something you could do with a hedge fund invest or an angel investor or something because it's like, hey, I have this great idea to build this hotel type Airbnb situation where people still have their freedom, but they can call us for anything. And it's real nice, real bougie looking, you know, and, and they they're all over. They're in 35 cities already. 
because they had an idea in real estate. They had funds from maybe five or six people to put up maybe fifty to a hundred thousand together to come up with business plans, come up with that first project, buy that first building. And Saunders started in buildings that already like condo buildings and, and three units. Yeah. To where they would just take a unit, deck it out and say this is a Saunders apartment. You know, so you start small to maximize in any way. You don't have to use traditional loans to, to get where you want to get in real estate. Would you say having this type of information is what sets you apart from other real estate agents? Um, I would say it makes me knowledgeable. It puts me in a category of real estate where um, I've always been like interested in how stuff work. So even if that's not my concentration of commercial properties and sales, I'm going to know how to do it. What sets me apart is the fact that I'm going to figure out exactly how to do it. I don't care if you come into me with a $35,000 a year job or a $5 million a year job. I'm going to help you the same way. I don't, I don't take on too many clients at once because I think you should cater to your clients. I, they need to be your best friend because this is a big life-changing deal for them. They're putting thousands and thousands of dollars on the line. They're going to come back to you if you mess up. So I really think it's important to build strong relationships to like one of my clients, the L.A. client. I could babysit their kids and stay in their house if I wanted to, you know, because I give that loving um, aspect. It's not just about money for me. It's about growth. It's about changing the dynamic of your life, because I had my family had a chance chance to change the dynamic of our life. And who knows what would have happened if we all were sleeping in our rooms that night. Looking back on your life, like. If you can give your younger self any advice, what would it be? Um, it makes me sad when I think about it. But it's like just believe in yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't You don't have to please everybody. Because everybody not for you. And it's, it'll be okay. You know, like you will be okay. Just don't be so hard on yourself because you really are unique. You really have your position in life all right before we get out of here tell everybody how they can get in tune with you stay in tune with you and find everything you have going on so i have uh, my instagram nitty's knocker and then i have my website nittycorn.com and then i have uh my soon to come podcast page some real tea and it's the real tea on real tea um so you can follow those pages and you could call me, you know, 312-933-6203. It's a personal number. There's no automated person who answers that phone. It's me. And I'm talking to you up until 8 p.m. On, on the weekdays. You know, you can hit me. Any questions you have, I will be your personal unicorn to help your dream come true. Like, I really want to be the unicorn in the room for everybody who is thinking of anything. Like, if you sleep... And some come to your mind like, I want to be like that thought. Like, let me ask Serenity, you know, because she'll know. So you can just keep up on my social media. Um, subscribe to my website because I do send out newsletters. Um, I'm going to be doing events. I have uh, some cool events coming up with the team that I work with, TNT Powerhouse. Um, my brokerage is also really cool. So, you know, just... My social media, you know everything I'm doing right from my social media. I don't really hide much. This is the first time I talk about all that, though, but. <laughs> I appreciate, like, I literally call my call my podcast Conversations with Jade just to have conversations like this. Like, you never know somebody that's out there going through the exact same thing you're going through that may draw inspiration from everything you just said. Exactly. So I want to pre I want to say I appreciate you for coming through and just being open and honest with me. I don't know what it is about that couch, but people come and, and they just they just give raw and real information That's that how it's normal supposed to people be. can use. And I, like I said, I don't know what's special about that couch, but somehow it just happens like that. What I learned in my radio journey is just about the intimacy, really. It's just really about you paying attention to what the person sitting across from you is saying. Because the more you pay attention to them, the more they'll give you. You know, so it's really just about being authentic and genuine and feeling like people, you know, be the unicorn. Facts. Yeah. So once again, thank you for coming through and just giving all the information you 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 did because I know very little about real estate, but I know enough just to get by. 
Right. And just you speaking on Saunders, that's what they call. Like, I never would have thought of an idea like that. You want so, another one real quick? Go ahead. If you buy an old warehouse building and spend maybe thirty, forty thousand 40000 renovating it into a storage, that's a self-funding uh, business because people pay for the storage units every month. They pay for their own insurance through whatever provider you work with. And then um, if they don't pay, pick it up or get insurance and stuff like that after so much time, you can sell their stuff. That's what, uh, what was it called? Uh, storage wars? Yep. Those are, they're, and that's like, you could never lose money because people always need storage. Facts. Have a competitive rate. Don't be greedy. And it'll make money. So once again, I appreciate <laughs> you for this information. And I just want people to be able to watch this interview and then actually call your phone. Actually jump in your inbox and say, help me. Yes. That's what it's about. That is. And don't feel afraid to say, help me, because none of us knew. No, I didn't know any of this. Like, I still don't own property because I had to teach myself how to own. And now that I know how to own, like, my money is getting up. My credit is getting up. All of that, you know. So it's okay to ask for help. Hey, shout out to the, the future millionaire in the room. Period. It's three of them in here. Facts. <laughs> now, uh, once again, I appreciate you for coming through. Thank you. It was fun. This has been another episode of Conversations with Jay.